Now that we've seen the ribs, we can talk about the space between the ribs, called the intercostal space. There are a lot of muscles and neurovascular structures that exist in this intercostal space. The first thing we'll see are the muscles that run between the ribs, appropriately called the intercostals. And there are three sets stacked on top of each other from superficial to deep. The first set is the most external set and called the external intercostals. Their fibers run in a diagonal orientation such that as they're going from one rib to the rib below, they travel somewhat medially, at least from this anterior point of view. And what that really means is that when these muscles contract, they have the effect of elevating the rib cage and expanding it, and causing the thoracic cavity to expand helps with inhalation. If we go a layer deep to that, we have the internal intercostals, but their fibers run in the opposite direction. And so they're gonna have the opposite effect. They're going to depress the rib cage, decreasing the thoracic cavity and causing exhalation. Finally, the deepest layer is the innermost intercostals. And their fibers have the same orientation as the internal, so they do the same thing. Now, the vasculature of the intercostal space is very interesting, and the first thing we have to talk about are these vessels called the internal thoracic or internal mammary arteries and veins that are branches of the subclavian arteries and veins. You'll notice that just below each rib, there's a little vein called an intercostal vein running along anteriorly until it meets the internal thoracic. Similarly, at each level, there's a branch coming off of the internal thoracic artery and running just below the intercostal vein called the intercostal artery. Finally, below that is a spinal nerve branch called the intercostal nerve. And that's our neurovascular bundle. Let's take a closer look at this bundle now in cross section. So in cross section, we again see external intercostal is the most external. Then we have the internal and finally the innermost. And it's between the internal intercostal and the innermost intercostal that this neurovascular bundle travels. And some people use the mnemonic VAN, V-A-N, to remember the order of this bundle from superior to inferior. So superior, we have the intercostal vein, then we have the intercostal artery, and then we have the intercostal nerve. So vein, artery, and nerve. So that's a good start to talking about the vasculature, but there's a little bit more to the story. So let's zoom out a little bit so we could see a fuller picture. So we have the subclavian artery, as we mentioned, giving rise to the internal thoracic or internal mammary artery. And that's where we're gonna get those anterior branches of the intercostal arteries. But it turns out they're gonna anastomose with some coming from posterior. Most of those are gonna come directly off of the aorta, except for the first two, which tend to come off something called the costocervical trunk of the subclavian. But otherwise, these posterior ones arise directly from the aorta and they'll anastomose with the ones coming from the internal thoracic artery. So if we put it all together, we can see how that fits. So again, from superficial to deep, we have the external intercostal, internal intercostals, and the innermost intercostals. Posteriorly is where we have the aorta, giving rise to the posterior intercostal arteries that are traveling, again, between internal and innermost intercostals. Now, it's also gonna give some other branches. So there's a dorsal branch that's gonna go off and supply the back, and there are gonna be branches that pierce through the muscle to provide supply to the overlying skin. Before the anastomose with the anterior intercostals coming from the internal thoracic artery, which itself is gonna give some perforating branches to supply the overriding skin. And if we go back to an anterior view, we can see the intercostal vessels and nerves in their little bundle in the intercostal space. And again, we see the internal thoracic artery running along either side of the sternum internally. And if we look inferiorly, we see that it's gonna end. It's gonna bifurcate into two arteries at its termination. The first is gonna head off sort of laterally, diagonally, and it's gonna supply abdominal muscles and the diaphragm, and so it's appropriately called the musculophrenic artery. 
musculo for the abdominal muscles, and phrenic because phrenic refers to diaphragm whenever you see that term. The other branch basically continues along a vertical path, becoming the superior epigastric artery. And if you haven't picked up by now, the theme with anatomy is if you hear superior so-and-so, there's probably an inferior so-and-so. And there is an inferior epigastric artery that will come from pelvic vessels below an anastomose with the superior epigastric artery right around the umbilicus, which is our fancy word for belly button, providing an important source of collateral supply in case you ever get an obstruction in your abdominal aorta. All right, so let's look at those nerves a little bit greater detail. So we already mentioned that the intercostal nerves run in that same groove in between internal and innermost intercostals. And they're also gonna give off branches along their course too. So they're also gonna have lateral cutaneous branches and supply the skin that's overlying the rib cage in that area. And that's why dermatomes look the way they do. Dermatomes look like rectangular strips that are roughly about the size and shape of an intercostal space. There's gonna be cutaneous branches anteriorly, and there's gonna be some stuff happening posteriorly that is a little smaller, so we're gonna zoom in to look at it. So here we see the spinal cord with its anterior and posterior roots. And then we have the posterior ramus of this spinal nerve that's coming out at this level, immediately going to the back and supplying structures in the back, whereas the anterior ramus is essentially what the intercostal nerve is. And running parallel to the vertebra on either side are sympathetic trunk with its ganglia. And they're gonna communicate with these spinal nerves at each level via the gray and white rami communicantes, which is just a very long word for communicating branches. We're gonna wrap up with some minor muscles in the intercostal space, starting with subcostalis muscles or subcostales which are variable and tend to only exist really on the lower ribs, but they do attach to the internal surface of one rib and then skip a couple ribs, and they don't attach again until two or three levels below. And they have the same fiber orientation as the internal and innermost intercostals, so they're gonna have that same function of assisting with exhalation. And then the last one is the transversus thoracis, uh, also a very variable muscle, but generally is gonna sit along the internal surface of the, mm, say, two to six ribs, whether it's at the bony part or the cartilaginous part, that varies as well. And then they'll attach to the lower half of the sternum where the body and the xiphoid process are. Same deal they have a very minimal effect on breathing. And it's the same as the other muscles we just mentioned where they depress the ribs and assist with exhalation. Though it's important to keep in mind that all of the muscles we've mentioned, whether they help with inhalation or exhalation, are really assistive or accessory. They're not really the primary drivers of breathing. By far, the primary driver of inhalation is the diaphragm. And for the most part, passive exhalation is just from elastin fibers that exist in the lung. So these are really minor muscles of respiration.